welcome everyone to CNG TV. I'm Liz Bruner and I'm so excited to have my next guest here joining me because he's from Harvard University and we're in Boston. So just across the river, right? That's right. <laughs> Boy, has the workplace changed. This is Dr. Ethan Bernstein from Harvard University. I should say you're a professor there. And you study the impact of employees' activities, their routines, their behaviors, and their performance. Really interesting work. What are some of the biggest trends that you're seeing in corporate real estate in terms of how technology is transforming things? So my research even more specifically is about the increasingly transparent workplace, its impact on all those things, Absolutely, on yeah. activities, behaviors of employees, and then the productivity of those individuals. And so I mean, one of the big, one of the big trends we're seeing is both more and more transparent workplaces, uh -huh. otherwise I wouldn't have a research agenda, <laughs> but also the sensors and data that come from those sensors yeah. on how people are doing their work. Well, and a lot of people are scared about that because then it brings into all these privacy issues when you think about computer logins and retina scans and all of these things. What does that mean for employee privacy today? Well, here's how, maybe one way to look at it, because privacy is a very broad term. It's topic. a very broad term, yes. Um, so let's talk about it this way. Data can really be used for one of two things. Okay. It can be used to control employees, and we tend to not like that and find ingenuity, <laughs> ingenuity way, uh, ways of being ingenuity, ways of being creative. Yes, I understand what you meant. <laughs> Human ingenuity is very good at finding ways of being creative around those means of control. Or we can use data to learn. Mm. And perhaps one of the ways in which we distinguish between whether or not we're controlling or learning is who's getting the data. Right. Is the data going to my manager, my peers, the people who can mm -hmm. ultimately wield influence over me, or is the data coming to me, in which case, like my Fitbit, I can actually learn to change my behaviors in productive ways. Right, right. So that's how privacy comes into this. If we really believe that this data is being collected by others, because right. it's often being paid for by others, then we have a privacy problem that typically results in having bad data, not good data. There's been a lot of talk about AI here at the summit over the last few days. How will, with, will that support employees in the future, in your opinion? So this, is, I mean, that's actually a bit far afield from my research. Um, so I, I'll, I'll mention what I've been hearing today, which yeah. is- What do you think? That we have data sets that are too large for human beings to process mm -hmm. real time. Mm -hmm. And so in order to keep up with that curve, mm -hmm. Mary Meeker has this curve of data we're collecting that she mm -hmm. presents in her annual um, review, keep up with that curve, the only way we can do so is by having some kind of computer-assisted analyses. And that's really what we're talking about is machine learning-based approaches or AI-based approaches sure. to looking at that data. Corporate real estate is continuing trying to prove a direct correlation between the changes in the physical workplace and the measurable business outcomes. In any of your research, will technology enable us to finally kind of get there to merge those things with the data that you're talking about? My view, is that we're going to have to deal with intermediate in outcomes for a while. Okay. So the paper that Stephen Turbin and I wrote that we were just presenting um, earlier today about the open workspace, right. the open office, we look at interaction, mm. not performance. Okay. Because interaction is something we can actually measure very clearly with the data and tie it directly back to the change in the physical space that prompted it. We do a pre-post mm -hmm. uh, experiment in which we show that. It, I think it would be very hard to use performance instead of interaction mm -hmm. and then try to generalize it to other environments because at every turn you're going to say, well, that's different in my context, that's different with my task, that's different in my industry, that's different in my geography. Mm -hmm. And so intermediate outcomes are probably going to be the, the recipe of choice mm -hmm. for a little mm -hmm. while. And then we can have the conversation about whether or not increased interaction or decreased interaction, in this case, increased or decreased face-to-face -face interaction, yields higher or lower performance in my context. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But until we have that first step, I think it's going to be hard to have that second. You just mentioned about speaking here at the summit, and you were talking about leveraging this data to create this dynamic environment. What's the top thing you could say that would create a dynamic environment? I know there's so many. <laughs> Oh, well, I, but I mean, to be honest, most of my research is not about that. Okay. So my research is more about the ways in which changes in the environment can change the way we interact, that we okay. communicate, we collaborate. And so if you want to define dynamic as interactive, okay. then at the very least I can say that we, we've seen through our data and through our research that 
um, going to open spaces actually reduces the face-to-face -face interaction. But even that could be more dynamic because it was replaced by online interaction, electronic mm -hmm. communication. And is that more or less dynamic? I suppose that depends on how you define dynamic. How do you define dynamic? Well, I would take a networks-based approach to that. So how many diverse um, individuals or nodes I'm drawing on upon, right. uh, to make decisions. And in that case, electronic gives me access to a lot more people sure. than I could ever have face-to-face. -face. But then again, we're sitting here in the middle of a floor with lots of face-to-face -face <laughs> exactly. interaction. So it feels very dynamic in here too. Right. Um, so part of the word dynamic, it just it depends on how you define it. What do you love about this research and this work? I know you're very passionate about it. You know, we've spent so many decades as academics looking at self-reported data, survey data, mm -hmm. to try and address some of the questions and concerns that I think real estate professionals have. Or for that matter, people who work in these spaces have. And it's very exciting to me that we now live in an environment in which through human eyes, and these other companies that are providing data and sensors and all this sort of quantified workplace, quantified self, it's very exciting that we can take that quantification and try to finally answer some of these questions that have been for too long, I think, left to intuition, mm -hmm. opinion. Mm -hmm. The clipboard walking the, around. Yes, I mean, <laughs> it, it was our best way of doing studies. Right. But we now have a way of doing studies that gets us a better answer, and that's very exciting. It is very exciting. It'll never be perfect. Not no. a perfect answer, but at least a better answer. A better answer. Professor Bernstein, thanks so much for joining us. Really Thank appreciate you. your insights. And thanks for tuning in. We'll see you next time here on CNG TV.